Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vicenzo Ciorbaro. Uh, I hope everyone's having a great fest. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the S3 storage engine, which is a way to archive data uh, within MariaDB on an S3 uh, service. So what does S3 stand for? Well, uh, it stands for Simple Storage Servers, and it's a way to store files in the cloud. It uses the HTTP protocol, uh, primitives, primitives such as get, put, or delete. And with these, you can send any file uh, into S3. This makes it ideal for archival purposes, uh, but it's not very good with lots of small files. Actually, the ideal file size is around four megabytes or so. And this is important because if you want to uh, access your data, especially if it's sp spread out around small, small files, you're going to incur a lot of uh, performance overhead, namely with the network transactions. So uh, this sort of uh, service is implemented by many different providers. Um, the original specification came from Amazon. Uh, with the goal of providing data with millisecond delay and cheaper storage overall, especially if you access your data less frequently. Um, so that's the goal of the service. Uh, let's see how we managed to do this with MariaDB. So MariaDB implements now a S3 storage engine and it is a way to interact with an S3 storage backend. Uh, with one simple command, you can move your tables from uh, a production or operational level storage engine like InnoDB into the archive version of S3. Uh, you, you, by doing this, you get them as read-only tables, but you can use them as any other select. The S3 storage engine is built on top of ARIA, and there is one key advantage to building it on top of ARIA, and that is that you benefit for free um, from all the optimizations that ARIA supports. And on top of that, it also works with partitioning. Um, there are some specific optimizations for S3, such as a compression and a very useful table discovery that lets you uh, access the data from multiple servers at the same time and to be able to reduce uh, network uh, latency, uh, it also has its own dedicated page cache, which is configurable. So let's see how we, we can use the S3 storage engine. The goal when it was first designed was to make it really, really simple to use. And all you need to do is configure where the S3 uh, provider is. So you need to provide the host name the S3's region, uh, in case it's a cloud-based uh, with multiple regions. Uh, then you need to tell it the bucket name. And uh, finally, just provide the uh, access key and secret key credentials that the S3 provider uh, supplies for you. Um, once you start up MariaDB with these settings and the plugin enabled, all you have to do is pick whatever table that needs to be archived and change the storage engine to S3. Changing it to S3 means that all the data from your uh, production table moves to uh, the archive. And that's all you need to do. Now, um, it's, it's important that you understand a little bit of how the storage engine works behind the scenes, because then you can more easily reason about the performance implications. So behind the scenes, um, we first tried to implement the S3 storage engine like a um, by using the Amazon SDK. Unfortunately, it didn't really go, um, it didn't have the API necessary that we wanted to use. So we ended up writing our own. Uh, we have a small library called libmaria s3 that behind the scenes uses libxml and libcurl for the networking aspects and the parsing of results. 
And with this uh, library, we, we have some logic on top of um, uh, ARIA. Now, the, the way things are stored, and um, because it's built on top of ARIA, you're going to see some um, similarities. Um, we store in S3 uh, each block as a separate file. And blocks are um, the size of the that's specified uh, as a parameter, and it's usually 4 megs in size. Now, the table definition still holds an FRM. And um, here you'll see, here's the example of some files that you can find on S3 once you've moved the table. So you're going to have the FRM, which stores some metadata about the table. You're going to have the first index block. Um, it's going to be called ARIA. And then subsequent index and data blocks are found in special and separate paths, the index and data paths. Um, the, the numbers here you see are prefixed uh, with zeros. The number of blocks is not limited to six digits. You can have more. We just chose to prefix um, a few more zeros just for easier reading. Assuming tables are uh, may maybe roughly around four gigs in size, or 400 gigs actually. Now, uh, with, with this in mind, Let's think how we could do replication with S3. So uh, the server can have um, can be configured in two ways. You can use the same uh, S3 storage uh, on both the primary and the replica, or different S3 storages. So if you're using different S3 storage, uh, there's really nothing you need to do. Uh, every action that happens on the primary server has to happen on the replica. So regular uh, replication will work just fine. The problem with this one is that you end up storing your data twice. And especially for a already high availability backup service, you don't really need a backup of the backup in this case. So the more favorable system is the one with uh, a shared S3 storage and multiple servers uh, used as a replication chain. <coughs> Now, the problem with uh, this one is that the replica server needs to do things a bit differently. Uh, some transformations need to happen. And these are that whenever you convert a table to S3, uh, when the information gets to the secondary uh, server, the table is already there. So all the um, secondary server has to do is to drop its own um, production level table. And then thanks to table discovery, S, the S3 storage engine will find uh, the, the table stored in S3. The reverse operation, we're trying to move from S3 back to a uh, operational data. The table has already moved by the time the replica sees uh, the uh, alter table command. So instead, the replica, all, all it needs to do is to drop the instance that it knows about of, um, of the S3 instance. And then it needs to recreate the table uh, as the destination storage engine. Unfortunately, this means that the, the replica does not have the data yet. Luckily, uh, the, serve, the master will send all the rows to it. So it will just insert all the data via, via regular binary logging. Now, you need to keep in mind that MariaDB is, by default, configured to assume separate storage, which means that the two relevant switches uh, replicate alter as create select defaults to on. This means that uh, all the tables rows are logged into the binary log. And then the slave will ignore any updates that happen to S3 tables. Now, this is what you want when the storage is separate. But if it's shared, the S3 uh, secondary server must make sure to ignore any updates to S3 tables because the updates are already there. 
And um, in case you are in this sort of configuration, you need to manually set your slave to ignore updates. All right, so that's about it for replication. Uh, let's see you some details of how we could make use of S3 in practice. Well, you need to take into account, like I've said before, that, um, that the speed of these tables depends on your internet connectivity. So there's no way that the first access can be faster than how long it takes for your internet to fetch the first block, the ARIA block from before. Uh, Follow-up accesses will hopefully have the blocks in the page cache, so they should not have to go over the wire to get your data. But just in case this is not enough, to speed it up, you can compress your data. And by compressing it with the compression algorithm equal zlib, a switch uh, for the uh, S3 engine, then uh, the, the amount of data stored in S3 is just the size of the compressed block. Um, so that's, that's a gain there. And in case that is still not enough, you can choose to increase your page cache. Uh, that way you can store more blocks in memory and you probably have to go less via the network. Now, because all, all of this is a network-based um, system, you need to keep an eye on network traffic. Usually, S3 providers will charge for your network traffic, um, which means that S3 tables are nowhere uh, near suited for operational use. However, they're very good for analytics um, and also infrequently access data like backups or disaster recovery situations. Um, by, by choosing to compress the S3 tables, you reduce both storage and network costs, but whenever you use the tables, you have to uh, do some more computations internally. So you might be CPU bound in that case. Although it's probably not something you should worry about, just something to keep in mind. All right, enough talk about features. Let's see how this uh, storage engine works in practice. Let's open up a terminal and see how we can make use of S3. All right, we're at the terminal here. So what I have here is I am running a MariaDB 10.5.5 server. So we can check this out real quickly. And I have the storage engine plugin enabled. And we can check that out by looking at information schema. So information, information schema plugins where plugin name like S3. And to get a nicer look, notice I have S3, it is active. The plugin maturity is still alpha, so there might be bugs. Uh, however, it is still very much usable. So let's see how we can use it. Um, before we put a table into S3, uh, first of all, let's have a look at what configuration file I'm running. So the key here is that I've set the S3 access keys uh, as well as specified the bucket and the region. I don't need to specify the host name because by default it is going to be using Amazon. And I have my data set up in Amazon for now. Let's go back to the server and um, let's have a look at our database. So employees, uh, we have a few tables here. Uh, it's taking a bit longer because it's doing engine discovery. Uh, we don't have any S3 tables inside um, uh, stored inside S3 yet, so nothing's been discovered. However, the biggest table here is salaries. So show create table salaries. We see it's still running InnoDB at this point. And uh, what this table stores is what salary a current employee by, via the employee number has had from a specific date to uh, another specific date. And we want to put this table into S3. And we can do this by just doing alter table salaries engine equals S3. 
Now this salaries table takes a while to uh, upload to S3. So whilst it's uploading, uh, let's talk a bit about the database. So the, uh, I got this database from Giuseppe Maxia's um, GitHub repository. You feel free to take to try it out. Uh, it's a very good uh, test case for prototyping because it's not a very small database, but it's not a very big one either. So it's good enough to, uh, to try out different things. And here I have my S3 management console. Now let's see if the table has finished uploading. So let's have a look in the terminal. And yep, we see that it's finished uploading in 24 seconds. Let's refresh our uh, S3 in interface. So I'm going to do an, a refresh. So loading. We see we have our database name here as a folder. Inside it, we have salaries, which is the table we just dropped in, into S3. And then uh, we have the FRM. We have the ARIA first block. And then we have data and index folders. If we look at data, here are our data blocks, each with the block size of four megabytes. And the final one is just not full enough yet. And likewise, we have for the index blocks, we have a bunch of index blocks. So far, so good. Um, now let's try and use this table like we would normally. So back to the terminal. Let's figure out what the average salary is. Actually, no, let's get the minimum salary first. Uh, and this is the first time I'm running a query. So the first time I'm running it, it has to go all the way to S3 and back. So it's getting all the data, putting it inside the page cache, and then it's computing my minimum salary. So we got it. We see it takes around 14 seconds. But now, what if I want to get also the maximum salary for, em for employees? I'm just going to do a max. And behold, I, it only took 0.7 seconds to get me the result. So that this time, it didn't even touch the network because we had all we needed inside the uh, buffer pool. Of course, it did have to check the network slightly. So there, that's why we have a little bit of delay compared to a local table. Um, but it's still much faster. Um, we can also do complex operations with this table. Now, what if we want to get the average salary for each employee? Well, we can do the average salary from salaries and we can group by um, employee number, but I want uh, the average of these numbers because this is going to be the average salary that each employee had. So I want to do an average from the result here. Um, and I'm going to turn this one into a derived table like so. So what I'm doing here, uh, I'm computing the average salary per employee, and then I'm taking the average out of all of these. And let's see how long this takes. 2.8 seconds. So we did have to do more computation, um, but we still didn't go all the way to network like we did here, where it took 14 seconds. So this is what makes the S3 storage engine good. Um, it optimizes network traffic. And if we run it again, uh, roughly same performance, which means that everything we had was in the buffer cache. All right, um, the, the final thing I, I want to do is, let's see if we can insert data into this table. So first of all, show create table salaries. And I'm going to try to run an insert, insert into salaries, values. Let's pick a, a random number, five. The salary is going to be 
30,000. The date is going to be, let's say, 2020, 10, 10. And uh, two date is going to be 2020, 10, 11. And notice that the table is marked as read only. So you cannot add data inside salaries once you've moved it to S3. You'd have to move it back to InnoDB or some other table, um, other operational table engine, and only then can you add um, values to S3. Um, all in all, um, the S3 search engine is still relatively easy to use. Just make sure you get your credentials right and you should have no problems afterwards. All right, I think this showcases the power of S3 in a few simple uh, steps. Uh, let's go back to the final slides. All right, now you've seen how S3 can be used. Uh, I need to point out some limitations before we wrap up. So uh, notice that because of the configuration system, there's only one S3 key per server, uh, per, uh, per MariaDB server. That means that you can't access multiple S3 providers from one MariaDB. Uh, there are plans to, to eliminate this limitation by storing um, the keys inside the MySQL servers. That's uh, probably for another development. Now replicas uh, on their own should make sure to not access S3 tables while the alter table command is running. Um, now the reason for this is that uh, there is no atomic transaction within S3, which means that um, trying to access tables whilst they're being uploaded to the cloud, you'd end up with some very strange results. Luckily, once the alter command is done, the replicas will be able to find the tables thanks to table discovery. And I did mention that S3 supports partitions. It does support partitions, but there are limitations. Um, operations like rebuild, truncate, or reorganize are not supported in S3. Um, that is a debate if we should try to lift those limitations. But do let us know. Um, and as I've mentioned, the minimum time for the first select is dependent on the S3 block size. So if that is a problem, you can try to reduce the block size. But keep in mind that we've already tuned S3 for optimum performance according to S3 specs. So reducing block size can uh, lead to faster queries, but it can reduce throughput overall. So make your choices according to your infrastructure. That's it. Uh, thanks for much, so much for listening, and I will be ready to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Mm -hmm.